Luke 7, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his, tear, his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, and she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this for who even forgives sins? And he said to the women, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Think of a time when you had to ask for forgiveness. Whether the event was big or small, it wasn't an easy task, was it? When you hear the word forgiveness, is there a certain event that comes to mind? There is for me. One night this past summer, I was down in central Illinois visiting my cousins. My cousin Lainey and I had earlier come up with the idea to tackle the task of Jelly Belly's bean boozled jelly beans. These jelly beans are randomly mixed into a box. They all look normal, but some of them, some of them are not flavored correctly. For instance, you pull out a brown jelly bean. This could be flavored chocolate pudding or canned dog food. There are also flavors like moldy cheese, rotten egg, and skunk spray. But there are also good flavors like popcorn, peach, and lime. So I brought two boxes of these jelly beans to their house. My brothers Nick and Luke and my cousins Lenny and Lan and I sat in a circle on the ground. We passed out the jelly beans and turned on our video camera. Three, two, one, and we popped the jelly beans into our mouths. Lainey and I high-fived because we both got lime. Then we looked at Nick and Luke, who were not as lucky. Then we looked at Landon, who seemed fine, but he claimed he got skunk spray. After a few rounds, Landon kept claiming he got all the bad flavors, so we figured he must just be immune to them. We now had about half the box left. No one wanted to eat any more. So Lainey and I came up with a dare. Since Landon was seemingly fine with all the bad flavors, we took the box and poured it into his hands and dared him to eat them all at once. We laughed as he put them into his mouth, but bit down and almost immediately spit them out. Then we watched as Landon started coughing and ran to the bathroom. Let's just say he didn't have any jelly beans left in him when this <laughs> epidemic ended. <laughs> Lainey and I sat in horror as we had just made her little brother sick. We were called into the kitchen for dessert, but I did not go. I sat alone, feeling terrible about what I had done. It was crazy that something so funny turned into such a horror in so little time. I sat there for the longest time, 
And then Landon walked in, and he sat next to me. I looked over at him and said, Landon, I'm so sorry. Can you forgive me? And his response was this, for what? <laughs> oh, that thing that just happened? Oh yeah, sure. I laughed because this whole thing that I was so upset over was nothing to him. I was completely thankful that Landon was so ready to forgive me. This experience reminds me of when Jesus said, therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. Because I showed I was so upset and sorry, Landon was ready to forgive me. He was ready to accept the fact this happened and move on. We now all laugh at this story because Landon was so ready to forgive me. So I ask you as you're leaving today, think about how easy it was for Landon to give forgiveness. I realize life won't always be this easy, but when someone wrongs us, I ask that you think of this story and try to be like Landon. Be the one ready to give forgiveness. Because as Mahatma Gandhi once said, Forgiven, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Amen. I stand before you today, someone who loves to talk. I am very social and converse with anyone who gives me the opportunity to. I have many deep, meaningful friendships and some that are still blossoming. But my friendships haven't always been so easy and natural. When I was in fifth grade, three long years ago, I had a small, tight-knit group of school friends. We would hang out at recess, have sleepovers, and, and dare I say it, giggle at each other during class. One day, out of the blue, and sometime in the early spring, they all decided not to speak to me anymore. That in and of, that in and of itself would have been fine, but on top of that, they would not tell me whatever I did to warrant this, and they sent me mean notes on the playground. This went on for a few months. The whole time, I refused to tell teacher because I didn't want anyone to get in trouble. Finally, a third party told my fifth grade substitute teacher and the whole nasty business ended. Flash forward a few months after the bullying ended and I had developed a terrible stutter. Some of you, some of you may have known me around this time and remember. There was a point that it was so bad that I couldn't speak in public without closing my eyes. Thankfully, my stutter has improved over the years. Now, as an eighth grader, I can speak fluently with friends, and I can mostly read aloud. Reading aloud is something that I still struggle with. It's hard because I'm seen as someone who's confident and a leader, but I can barely read aloud without stuttering. I know all the words, and I understand the reading perfectly, but I just can't get the words out of my mouth. The road to forgiveness has not been easy. To be honest, it's been plagued with spite and difficulty. Middle school has actually helped in this situation. Middle school is bittersweet. For those who are unlucky, it can be terrible, and I totally understand and respect that. But for me, it, it could not have come at a better time. There, those first few months of sixth grade, I was given the opportunity to make new friends and have a fresh start with a new group of kids. Flash forward two years after sixth grade to the present. I have moved forward with my life. I speak in front of people all the time now. I have the female lead in the school play, was an MC in the school talent show, and am an officer on the student council board. 
I'm not saying this to brag, but only to show you how much I've grown since the experience. Occasionally, I'll look back on it. I've matured a great deal since the bullying took place, and I've been able to put it into perspective. I have learned that to truly understand a situation and a person's motives for doing things, you have to step back from your emotions and take a deep, unbiased look at the situation. People may surprise you. Through practicing this, I've been able to realize that I did not do anything wrong. In other words, that the bullying that ultimately led to the stutter is not my fault. The world is not black and white. No one is all good or all bad. This has helped me come to the conclusion that the girls who hurt me all that time ago were not bad people. They made a mistake. They were insecure and did not know how to deal with their feelings properly. Luke 747 reads, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. I have forgiven, and still am forgiving, because it's the right thing to do. And in a way, forgiveness has been cathartic. In other words, it's helped me heal. My story is not unique. People all over the world have been hurt by someone else and have therefore been given the opportunity to forgive. Some have taken it and forgiven, and some have yet to do so. If I had not forgiven, forgiven them then, I would never be in the place I am now, with new people and a lot of new friends. To forgive is to release. The aggressor, yes, but more importantly, yourself. Thank you.